Hello, everyone. Welcome or welcome back to The Dan Nessel Show. I'm your host, Dan Nessel. So let me ask you a question. Do you bring your authentic self to work? How about at home? Are you authentically you? I'm sure that many of you automatically, almost reflexively say, oh yes, I'm able to be my authentic self wherever I am. But what does that really mean? Many of you know that I've had issues with this concept. Said so in the show a few times. And if it's simply like be yourself, then I can get behind it. But what if your quest for authenticity ends up meaning, hey, what's good for me is what's authentic. And if that's the case, then does being your authentic self at work have the potential to conflict with what's good for your colleagues and your company and your customers? Look, these are deep questions. I certainly don't have the answers, but my guest tonight may be able to help. He's an organizational and leadership development practitioner and scholar, the founder and CEO of Sales Conservatory, and a self-described recovering executive with over 25 years of business and technology experience. He's a firm believer in the power of sincerity and his philosophies and ideas offer a unique behavioral perspective on business, relationships, and more. Now, I'm curious to learn about those ideas, about sincerity versus authenticity, and much, much more from a man who embodies the learning mindset, at least in my opinion. Please welcome to the show, Dr. Tom Tonkin. Tom, it is tremendously great to see you. I've been waiting for this for a long time. Uh, How are you? Dan, thanks so much. And what a what an interesting introduction that you bring up because it was of a, what, 15, 20 years ago that I, I think I asked myself that same question <laughs> um, about authenticity, because by the way, I was all into authenticity. Yeah. And um, as we'll sort of the conversation here will unfold, the more I did research on authenticity with the express purpose of relationship building, the more disillusioned I became. Ooh. Very, and, it's a very controversial statement these days. Yes, it is. Yeah. And, um, but it, 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 as you'll find out here in, in the show, um, I, I, I tend to be very cognitive centric, very analytical in pretty much everything that I do. Um, you know, feelings wane and fade and grow. And, and if mm-hmm. you start putting your reality, um, your realities, or your concept of realities into your feelings and your reality morphs into other things. Yeah. And so that's why I tend to sort of ground myself, you know, think of it, you know, sticks in the ground and life to, you know, data, hopefully removing the bias and everything that comes with it. And so I chase this down. I chase this down around authenticity. And like I said, it, it really disillusioned me when it came down to relationship building. Now, far be it for me to say, you know, throw authenticity out the window because right. I think it's a place for it. Unfortunately, I think it's misplaced in today's society. I clearly agree with you from what I said in my intro and <laughs> the way I sort of teed this up. Um, but, and and I, I also want to be clear that being authentic um, is, an, is, is a virtue, like being true, being honest. Um, you know, basically not bullshitting is what the way I look at it at a very simple level. Uh, and, and when you're at work, you should be, you know, honest and forthright and, you know, your, yourself, so to speak, uh, with your colleagues and with your, with your employers. That's all about values alignment. That's all about, um, belief in the purpose of the company. It's all about, you know, loving your job or, or at least liking your job enough, all of those elements together, I think kind of build you into that authentic person. You, people see you and you, what you see is what you, you're not lying. You do, you're going through the day doing what you're supposed to do. But when it starts to get into this whole, the kind of, you know, demand that you bring your authentic self to work and you can't have an, you can't have a, you can't have contentment. You can't have a re- rewarding work experience, unless you are your quote unquote authentic self. That's where I start to get a little bit edgy and, you know, nervous about that. I, I, cause I think authentic self means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And that's, 
that's where I, I, I feel like, you know, we get into trouble um, or we have, there's a lot of potential for trouble. So, I mean, it's interesting yeah. to say about being uh, authentic as it pertains to, say, honesty. Let's just kind of rip that one apart because that premise is is how my doctoral journey began. Okay, that's a great <laughs> way to kind of you got to this doctoral journey where you're questioning authenticity. How did you? arrive at that. And I think it's, you've got a fascinating journey. I, and I'd, I'd love you to kind of explore that, the context around that and how you got there, because it's, it's not just enough, I think, to say, you know, one day I woke up and I, I thought there was a problem with authenticity. It's, it takes a certain mindset and certain kind of person to do that. You know, you, one of the things I think we all have to come to the conclusion is so, so the scholarly world is usually significantly more ahead of the practitioner world. And usually practitioners have an issue with that, right? Because, you know, the, the, the term, you know, but that's academic or that's so academic is this thing that is useless and not fruitful and all that. And mm -hmm. the fact is, and maybe I am biased, but the fact is, if you look at the reality, that's where it all starts. You and I would not have fancy microphones had someone not come up with a theory about how sound travels through these wires, so somebody along the line has to go build it, i.e. the practitioner, but they're based upon the academic research that came with it. So that's part one. Part two is we have to understand the backdrop of the social culture, because as much as academics like to think about things in a, in a, in a vacuum to, to bring purity to their thought, um, the thing we have to realize, too, is that it's usually with a backdrop drop of social context. So one of the things I'd like to put for your listeners is this idea of how do, how do we get here on a timeline? So mm -hmm. go back right before authenticity and the other leadership term, you know, relationship term was transformational leader. Mm -hmm. That was Isn't coined. That yeah. So that was still kind of in vogue. Yeah, I mean that, that mm. it's in vogue because uh, it's cool, right? Mm -hmm. when, you know, you want to be a transformational, but I'm I'm talking about it. It's more pure academic operational definition mm -hmm. that was created in 1994. Okay, and that was that came from the need to move out of the 80s type of of leadership that was going on, which was very much sort of a Machiavellian view of leadership and the sort of, you know, me first. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the bro culture. Culture. Yeah. And transformation had a lot of tentacles into other people. And so it was actually created by two gentlemen, Bass and Avolio, in 1994. Um. What was interesting was Bernard Bass, great leader, uh, leadership mind. You know, in, in, in the academic world, you always have this banter back and forth as to how philosophies get developed. Bernard Bass had this view that leadership had no moral ground at one point, meaning that – and and. and that that I'm going to be very controversial here, um, meaning that at one point you could say, we'll put a definition on here for a second of, of, of there's a, a gentleman by the name of Gary Yukel that put a definition of leadership that said um, leadership is the force exerted on followers to achieve a common goal. Right. That's the operational view. Right. Mm -hmm. That sounds force sounds terrible, but it's like influence. Right. That's the idea. It's like I'm going to place some influence on you and therefore we're going to achieve some kind of common goal. Bernard Bass came around and said, yeah, you're absolutely right. And that force can come in all sorts of flavors. It could be influence, right? You can go back, you can go back all the way to 1959. Hmm. Um, uh, French and Raven <laughs> wrote about the five powers of the five different powers, like off, um, reference power, right? I follow people because I like them. Expert power. I follow people because they're smarter. They know something. Coercive power. I follow people because they'll beat me up if I don't. 
right? There's all of these types of powers that you can place. And so you you start doing the substitution game and basically saying, hey, look, you can put any of that stuff and achieve leadership to the point that there's a there's a tremendous view of leadership out there that says Hitler, for example, was a really good leader. Oh. Right? Because it fulfills the operational view of that. Um, yeah. That was sort of that there was a, a tremendous amount of pressure placed upon Bass and, and, and some of his contemporaries, Bennis and McGregor, that basically said, no, 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 you can't be talking like that, dude. <laughs> That's not the case. And so he he kind of backtracked a little bit of that, said and there was a moral component to it. All right. So that was kind of a little roundabout way to saying, OK, Bernard Bass then moved forward with Avolio. Bernard Bass passes away. Avolio, Bruce Avolio, who is a professor of team leadership up at University of Washington as we speak, good man, brings this to authenticity. 2005 was the birth of authenticity, which is a revision of transformational leadership. As a matter of fact, what was interesting is one of the biggest examples of transformational le leadership was Kenneth Lay. <laughs> That C name rings a bell to me. <laughs> CEO Just, of Enron. Of Enron. There you go. <laughs> that's why. Oh, bad bell. Exactly. <laughs> bad so, bell. but see, that, that's why I'm kind of painting you with these maps of these villains of history uh -huh. and how they were mapping back to leadership. And people say, no, 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 no. Leadership's this great, wonderful thing. And we should all be great leaders. And I was like, okay, but. You're now being inclusive to some of these folks. And th this, this conversation continues in, 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 in the literature. So we, now we're in 2005. Bruce Avolio then talks about this, and he brings about um, – and, and again, he's not, he's not by himself. There's a guy by the name of Fred Luthens and some other people that kind of jump in with him and, and say, you know, 2005, authentic leadership and authenticity, that's just the way to go. Well, hmm. arrives this young, naive Tom Tonkin and says, yeah, you're right. I'm all in, dude. Let's let's do this. And I start looking at it. One of the components of authenticity as defined by Avolio is internal morality. Right? He basically says you really you really have to have some moral compass to be a, a good leader. Yeah. And what I found very interesting is if you take a look at all the different aspects of of authenticity and how he defined it. They were all self-referential, meaning mm -hmm. when you said internalized morality, morality basically is what you believe to be true and right in internally. Ethics is kind of us playing together in a set of house rules of what's good. And the question becomes is if, if these were consent, you know, if these were Venn diagram circles, mm -hmm. The best of all worlds would be that circles would be the same. Right? My internal morality matches exactly to the ethics and yours is the same. So we're all playing in the same. Well, you and I both know that that's just not the case. Yeah. So now what? <laughs> right. So now we have this construct <laughs> with authenticity. And that's kind of where I really took off and started developing. Well, what about this? What about the, the communal or the social part of this construct? To be to to sort of round out this view of authenticity and the way it was defined. And the reason I'm using this definition is because everybody will bring in dictionary definitions of being true and honest and self and all this other stuff. Yeah, kind of like kind of like what I right. said in the in the upfront. It's the way I the way you just think about it on a day to day. But this is extremely useful to yeah, so, me to so, flesh so, yeah, out my so own you view. Lay out yeah. the operational view. Let's. So there's four major components. One of them I already talked about the internal morality. Another one is self awareness. Another one is transparency, and the last one is some fancy term called balance processing. Balance processing is kind of the nod to the leadership part of it that says, you know, I'll I'll consider your ideas when I make decisions. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's a little more deeper than that because, I mean, that's, you know, these academic wonky terms, and this is where everybody has issue with the, the, the academy, but – yeah. I'm one of those academics that tries to be cool to try to be able to say, no, no, here's, let's just get to the punchline, right? And okay. that's what that really means. Mm -hmm. Now, Dan, here's the interesting part. I gave you four, four dimensions. The commonality for all those four things, it's, it's basically me. 
right? It's just my self-awareness. What's that about? Well, it's about me. <laughs> my transparency, what's about? It's about me. My, my morality is me. Balance process is my consideration. Mm -hmm. So I came to the conclusion shortly thereafter, maybe 2010, 2011, that basically says, you know, this is not very useful for, for a relationship building situation, especially around leadership. Because leadership is a communal social construct. Well, I think it was, uh, was it Drucker, one of these big head, big minded guys in leadership says, if you're a, if you're a leader out, you know, with no followers, you're just a guy out for a walk. Um, right. So <laughs> it's like, there's no <laughs> purpose being exerted here. And so that, so the question becomes is how do you, how, you know, followership, believe me, it's a, another huge discipline that how do you get people to, you know, to, to engage you, to you as a leader. So let me so pause there because I've talked a lot. I want to. Well, yeah, I was gonna. I was gonna say, yeah. like, I can keep. You can keep talking. By the way, this is fascinating. Um, the way that I had looked at authenticity, and actually, you know, this is this is fleshing out some of the things that I've already been thinking. But I haven't done any back any academic study of this whatsoever. Um, it's just experience, but um, and my own kind of dalliances with language, you know, like as a, as a storyteller, as a communicator, meaning the meanings of words are, is, is, in, are incredibly important. Um, and it, it, it does get under my skin or maybe into my core, um, revulsion mechanisms when, you know, words change for no reason whatsoever, or when they're assigned new meanings that we're all sort of forced to accept, um, and then kind of move forward. And now sometimes that's, that's evolution. I mean, sometimes it's, it, it, it points to changes in the marketplace or changes in, in, in society, whatever. I'm not the person to make that judge, judgment call, but you know, when I think about authenticity in that, in that, in that respect, you know, I think about, okay, the core meaning of authenticity is authentic. You know what it's a, it's, it's real, realist, real, like what, what's real, real and authentic should be the same thing or, or very, very similar. Um, and just keep going from, keep going from there. It just means, then you say, okay, it just should mean being honest. should mean being yourself. should mean, you know, what you see is what you get type of, type of a thing. Um, but now that, you know, I'm hearing, you know, the real, the way that this was formulated and the self-referential part of this makes a lot more sense to me. So it's more, it's your internal morality. It's the self-awareness, it's transparency and balance processing to me, the transparency and balance processing are kind of behaviors and morality and self-awareness are qualities. Um, so it's, it's, it's not a really useful roadmap necessarily. I, it's, <laughs> that's correct. <laughs> yeah. It's, 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 I'm trying to think it through and, and, you know, the context that me and I'm sure many of our listeners are in every day is, you know, we're sort of told we go to work and, you know, hey, you know, you're in a great environment when you're free to bring your authentic self. That's what you hear all the time. You're free to be your authentic self. Um, but if I'm free to be, to have, an, to have my own internal morality, you know, I should be self-aware. I mean, obviously that's the thing that we all, we all should be self-aware. That's, that's a very highly desirable trait. Um, and transparency Right. And, uh, but, and balance processing, I suppose, you know, the operational side of this, making yep, sure that, correct. right. Yep. I, those are all, those are good things, but that internal morality piece, you're right with that Venn diagram. So just to bring it back for the, for our listeners here, there could, there's a lot of room for disconnect there. And that's right. what I'm grabbing from you. <laughs> well, I mean, so I'm, 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 I'm glad that my, my sort of depiction of authenticity <laughs> resonated with you because you you did a great eloquent job of repeating that for your listeners because exactly true i have not I have nothing more to add to what you said okay and so nice if, see you. If, if right so if that's all true <laughs> right yeah, exactly <laughs> goodbye everybody. um but if if that's all true then yeah. the question is okay so what do we do to apply this and what what what, what does this mean to my life mm -hmm. one of the things that's very interesting about what you, there's two points at what you said I want to go back to. Number one is you talked about this idea of meaning of words. Part of my background uh, in education is I'm a master practitioner in neuro-linguistic programming. Mm, right. 
one of the things that I think we have to understand from a communicating perspective is we can say words, but it's the recipient that actually brings those words to life, right? If you say something to me, I am going to apply meaning to your words, regardless of what your intention was around those words. Mm. One of the things that I used to say many times, because my mother's Brazilian, and uh, I, I just moved her out of the, her home into a in, into a, a facility. She's got dementia; it's pretty severe. I'm sorry that. Um, yeah, but but she's safe and she's happy and she doesn't know it. So that's always an interesting okay. part of the discussion. <laughs> um, but she's Brazilian and she always had a thick accent. And I grew up speaking Portuguese at home. When she was really mad, she would curse and she would curse in in, in Portuguese and and. And bad things happened. <laughs> um, but I grew up in the United States. My father was uh, an American. And I could curse up a storm in English and it wouldn't amount to anything at home. Hmm. Because my mother didn't have that experience and all of the upbringing and the culture around that. But boy, if I wanted to get her attention, all I needed to do is drop a Brazilian curse word and you know <laughs> let the fireworks start yeah why is that right because it was she's placing the meaning behind it hmm. so i think that's one of the important parts about it is people always say well here's what i said i bring my authentic self and all that. let's test like let's let's test authenticity if i take the the operational view of what you said being real being authentic mm -hmm. genuine right these terms come up Everybody in an earshot of this podcast has been to multiple Mexican restaurants. Yeah. Um, not only have you been to multiple Mexican restaurants, I'm sure that the word authentic was either on the name of the restaurant or on the menu. Authentic Mexican food. Now tell me, mm -hmm. <laughs> if you were to take a taco from one restaurant and a taco from another restaurant and compared them, would they be the same thing? Clearly not. I'm Clearly sensing not. the they, holes in my, in my own definitions. Well, now, by but, the way. but you know, I, I, <laughs> That's I, okay. I, I try to do that in a very sort of polite way. So I appreciate it. <laughs> but yeah, there are elements, you know, mm -hmm. there are elements of, of, of truth to those. They probably had a shell where you stuffed and, you know, there's, there's some traits but they're they're different. So when someone says be your real, be authentic, we're really talking about self-referentiality at this point. Mm -hmm. Because that taco in restaurant A is an authentic taco within the context of that restaurant. Yeah. As it is in restaurant B. The minute I bring it up to a more communal view, all authentic Mexican restaurants, now we got an issue. Now mm. replace those tacos with people. Yep. Within your confines of who you are, you may be this authentic self bringing in the referentiality terms like, I don't know, honesty mm. and transparent and, you know, whatever other cool self-referential terms you want to use. Now I bring another Dan from some other universe, right? And, 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 and they have their authentic self. And now I place them in a more communal view and they become two different Dan's. Um, because, and I used attributes like honesty. I'll give you one. Mm -hmm. I just told you about my mother. Yeah. Uh, was a couple of weeks ago, went to visit. I try to visit her on every, every week and she's actually about an hour away and it's a challenge to get to see her. But when I see her, which, by the way, she doesn't even remember who I am. So it's just, it's, it's, I visit her from my personal perspective, not necessarily for hers. Um, she starts bringing up the idea of like, you know, how's, you know, how's your grand, you know, my father, how's your grandfather or something like that. And it's like, well, he had passed away, you know, 60 mm -hmm. years ago, whatever it was. <laughs> am I going to be the person that says that to her? <laughs> yeah. Right. Am I going to turn around and say, you know, you're wrong, you know, grandpa died many years ago and have her relive that pain because as far as she's concerned, he's alive and well. Of course not. 
right? Yeah. Go with it. A purist might turn around and say, well, Tom, that's not being authentic. You're lying. Mm -hmm. You're all this other stuff, right? So, but wait a minute. But I know what I know, and she knows what she knows, and we have to live in a community of people. Mm -hmm. And we have to have some ethical, moral connection between each other mm -hmm. that defies article be what might be honest. My essay that I submitted to get into my doctoral program, which is a rather competitive program, was a view on honesty. Mm. One of the examples that I provided uh, in the essay was, now, you know, this, depending on who your listeners are, they may or may not pick up on this, but everyone... They're very, very they smart and brilliant and wonderful people. They'll pick up on everything. <laughs> no, no, this is more historical than anything. <laughs> I'm, just I'm not kidding it's about just, them being wonderful, but well, let, I, I want to bring up Watergate, right? Nixon and mm -hmm. Watergate, right? So, you know, basically, what for those that may not really know what happened was um, the Republican campaign that was led by you know President Nixon and everything with it uh, installed some some recording devices in the Democratic campaign to you know figure out what their strategies were and try to defeat and win the election. Um, so Nixon, so, so they're having, you know, Watergate goes on and finally he has the infamous David Frost interviews, mm -hmm. which were, I think were chronicled in the movie. Frost um, Nixon. Yeah. Um, but by the way, those, that was a real, <laughs> that was a real set of interviews on TV back in, in the yeah. late seventies. And I remember watching it and there's a, there's a, a phrase in there that, Richard Nixon, when he's looking at David Frost and into the camera, says, he basically says, with the greatest conviction that I've ever seen anybody say anything, he says, if the president does it, it's not illegal. Huh. And he believes it. So now we've introduced a new level of morality <laughs> and, 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 uh, and ethics. Which is now the actions could be the same, but they're missing. They're, they could be interpreted differently on who you are mm -hmm. at at a societal level. So I found that to be fascinating, and I, I introduced honesty. The other thing I want to put out there to your to your listeners, Dan, is um, there's a book called The Leadership Challenge by two gentlemen by the name of Kuzis and Posner. I think it started in 1988, 87, something like that, where they basically went around the country and they had 36, 35, 36 leadership traits. And they would do kind of a leadership dog and pony. Uh, forgive me, gentlemen, if you're ever listening to the show. I know it's more <laughs> than that. But they used to have a leadership type of presentation. But before the presentation started, they would just pass this piece of paper around and they would say, out of these leadership traits, circle your Circle your five, right? Circle your top five of what you hmm. think leadership is. I think they're in edition, fifth edition now of the book, Leadership mm -hmm. Challenge, something like that. And each time the edition comes out, they report on the top five uh, over that period of time. So uh, I think, you know, the punchline, there's five or uh, I'm sorry, seven or eight top uh, traits that kind of bounce around in the top five. But number one has never given relented <laughs> that spot in the 20 some odd years that that book's been around. 20? Maybe, yeah, 20. 30 years? <laughs> I guess I'm losing track. Um, that number one has never, never given up that spot. What is that trait? Putting me on the spot again. Uh, is it? We're talking about it. Is it honesty? Transparency? Yes, sir. Yeah. yeah. Honesty. Honesty has never given up as the number one trait of leadership in that study. Even over now, what's important about this, Dan, remember I t started this conversation with the timeline of how things go about mm. in, in the business, right? How do you, or, or in, in, the, in the academy, how you, chronicle these things, you know, with, you know, with transformational and authenticity. Yep. Cause we're okay, still 20 so years got before this... authenticity when this starts. Correct. Right? Yeah. But yet here we are, the books didn't release, you know, cause they do this revised editions and stuff and honesty is still up there. Mm -hmm. 
So for whatever reason, honesty hasn't relinquished over these many multiple decades. So the question I had in the essay, and I have a question here for you and for the rest of the listeners is, what? why do you think honesty is in the top spot? By the way, I don't know the answer to this question. Mm-hmm. So, I think it's projection, right? I mean, you know, people say that they just, you know, at least in my career and, I, and I'm not, uh, you know, I'm a leader of sorts now. I haven't always been, but I know that the people that, um, that I work with and the people that I support and the people who, um, who are, you know, unfortunate enough to have me as their leader. Uh, I know that they, you know, they appreciate more than anything else when I tell them what's happening, right? That tr- it's transparency as well. But, you know, when you, when you're not, when you don't give the whole story, there's a, a, a feeling of that withholding of information is seen as either dishonest or, um, you know, bad faith or, or, shifty at in in the worst cases um so it it just it it would seem to me that you want honest leaders because of trust right you you want to trust them you want to believe them you want to follow them and you want to know that when they say something and you do it that you're doing the right thing that you're on the right path so it's a, it's a val- i think there's a validation element there too um but i don't know it's just off the top of my head. No, I mean, that's, you know. and this is the conversation. And so yeah. as, as I posed it in the essay and, and continued to explore this reason, I came up with basically two options. Mm-hmm. A, good leaders are all over the place and they're all honest. And so we should continue doing that. Or B, we have all these leaders and no one's honest and we need to find it. <laughs> I mean, those are the two conclusions that you can come from that statement. Mm-hmm. If somebody from another planet were to land <laughs> here and didn't know anything, and you started pointing to leaders, whatever you mean by leaders, whether business or mm-hmm. popularity or whatever, which one do you think they'd say? Like about? About, the- about honesty. Would they say, my goodness, the common thread of all of these leaders are on are, are, are being honest? Oh, of those of your two choice of your of your yeah, mannequin choice choices, there? right? Yeah. I mean, they clearly would say that um that honesty is not part of the equation. It's missing. <laughs> right. I mean, uh, at least, take a at look, least. You, some if somebody mm-hmm. if a, a, a an alien, and the reason I use this sort of <laughs> fictitious yeah. view of it is I'm trying to say you're devoid of all cultural yeah. connection or, or perspective and you show up on this planet and you don't and and someone said dan i know i'm the alien take me to to your leader who would you who would you bring to me you know i mean you bring them to who whomever society deems as your leader at that i mean well, very, how, no I, I mean be yeah. real specific dan who would you bring who would you say here is a, a an example of a good leader you know i'm not saying this because i am um I'm an employee of this company, but I really think the CEO of my company is a tremendous leader. Right. He's fantastic. Um, and then, yeah. Okay. So we put that and somebody yeah. would say, so I'm not saying he is or isn't, yeah, I, yeah. I don't know him, but if somebody, some an alien came to me, I would probably be somebody else mm-hmm. and all the way down the line. And it would be interesting to see other people that potentially you and I don't necessarily agree with what kind of leaders they would present. Yep. To, to these aliens and would trust and honesty and all those words that you say be common across all of these people? Yeah, I don't think so. I don't think so either. And so now thinking about our two options that I laid out, the more plausible of the two is we don't have enough honesty in our leadership ranks. I completely agree with you there. Certainly in the Actually, in, in all in all aspects of our society, probably that's true. And I know that, you know, we say my show does not really dig into politics, so we're not going to go there. Um, but in a general sense, I think we can all agree that there's a real honesty problem in politics. There's an honesty problem in industry. There's an honesty problem in, you know, uh, in non-governmental institutions. 
you just read the uh, Edelman Trust Barometer any year, and you know that well, that's a, that that's a great. Uh, I'm I'm a big yeah. fan of that. Again, yeah. right? This goes back to one of the first things I said on your podcast, right? Is trying to ground myself mm-hmm. in in realities that are they're factually ba- based, in, re- even if they go against what I believe or how I see things. Yeah, because that kind of keeps me fulfilled and honest as well. So my my point is, and this is a roundabout way, hopefully people are kind of keeping track on the program because in my mind, I'm, I'm meandering through a story here that brings me to back to this movement from authenticity into mm-hmm. sincerity. Yep. I mean, now now you're, you're, you're definitely at the place where I was hoping to get to, you know, now, but I wanted to kind of frame that up a little bit um, or at least kind of ask you to make a more, a clear connection now. So we've been talking about honesty, um, could probably because I defined authenticity as partly in, in terms of honesty in some ways, um, earlier, but, um, we t- we've been talking about honesty and it's, it's kind of clear that, especially from the Nixon story, um, th- from a self-referential point of view, honesty can mean different things to different people. And if honesty is also the core of authenticity, then it follows that authenticity has that same problem. That is correct. Um, and, you know, especially if you look at that, that first behavioral or not the behavior, the first um, kind of trait that comprises authenticity, which is internal morality, that would define your sense of honesty. Uh, and, you know, I guess there's a, it's not exactly a simile, but it's, 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 it would define what you, it would give you the guidelines for, for what honesty is. So therefore, if you have a different set of morality, then your, then your honesty is different. And so is, so is your approach to authenticity. It's a, it's problematic. I am not adding any more to it because you're making my point. Thank you. Right. So, so now, right. So now you have this, right. Right. So now, now we've got Dan, Nestle, uh, Listeners, listen to Dan. He's laid it out for you. Now, what do we do with it? Yeah. Right? And and this is what brought me to 2011, 2012 and beyond. It's like, okay, so this is not very useful. Um, and I was a little disillusioned. I was kind of, honestly, I was a little upset because I was all like, I was going to be the authentic guy and it's all, you know, it, the end of the story would be done and all this. So I thought, okay, well, we got to go to sincerity. What does sincerity mean? Well. That ended up being the the uh, the theme of my dissertation that was published in 2014, the difference between authenticity and sincerity. Specifically, I landed on similarities and differences, thinking that there, there, there had to be both, and there have been. And a lot of the similarities come with this idea of sort of being true to self. But the problem was is, like you said, my honesty – is not your honesty, which sounds ridiculous when you say it out loud. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I mean, again, you can agree with some of the nuance. I mean, not the nuances. You disagree. With some of the, like, like, don't, like, don't kill people. I think that's probably Every, yeah. good. Yeah, there's, there's some basics. One, right? Yeah. Yeah, there's, a, there's some basis to this. However, change some context. You know, I mean, you, you know, the... And, and 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 not to bring politics into this conversation, but mm-hmm. I often wrestle with, you know, the you know capital punishment and abortion, and sure. and those two in the same bucket, mm-hmm. because all of a sudden, in one hand, I'm saying it's not good, but in the other hand, I'm saying it's good, and it's all based upon the the realities of the context that occurs. Yeah. And so that's the same thing here. It's like our honesties and our realities change different point context. And that's really, really hard and manuable. So what did I do? So I said, okay, so what's the, the theme? So authenticity was really all about self-referentiality. Yep. I felt that if I'm going to use something as a relational construct, then I'm going to land on something that's others-centric. And that's, that's what took me to sincerity. Now, here's here's an interesting thing, right? Because, you, again, you'll see where my mind is and lays this out. In 1972, there was a book 
written by Lionel Trillian called Authenticity and Sincerity. (laughs) (laughs) And in that book, Trillian makes a point that we should be more authentic, (laughs) that we should depart from sincerity. Sincerity has – there's an aspect of being contrived. You know, let's, you know, the, the colloquial term might be butt kissing, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? Yeah. Where I'm being other centric, but disingenuous in yeah. that, right? Dan likes when I say nice things about him and therefore he'll treat me nice and he'll do nice things for me. Therefore, that's what I'll do. Yeah. I'm other centric. But that's insincere though, right? We know that's insincere. Yeah, well, that's correct. Yeah. And then again, yeah. there's, there's another quote, um, Again, from a pop culture, a show, MASH. You might have watched MASH mm-hmm. a long time ago. And uh, I think it was Hawkeye that said, you know, as, as, you know, and if you can fake sincerity, you got it made. Um, right? There's, you know, and everybody, then the laugh track kicks on. But there's mm-hmm. a, there's a, there's there's a truth there. aspect of that. There's a truth there, right? Because anybody who's ever worked in a corporation knows that's true. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so, and so, yes, yeah, so there is sort of this uh, perversion of these mm-hmm. words, authenticity and sincerity can, that, take, that can take place. Remove that from the conversation and try to find yeah. something that's operational in nature. And that's where I landed. So I gave you the four tenets of authenticity. Now I'm going to give you my three for sincerity. The first one is empathy. The second one is what I call purposeful um, altruism. And then the third one is demonstrable affirmation. And, you know, I'm writing a book about it and, and I actually have some well-known author friends that Mm -hmm. are helping me through that, that thought process, because here's the thing about writing the book on this thing. I'm too darn close to it. Yeah. And it's, it's, (laughs) if I, if I, took everything I ever wrote about it, it would be volumes. And yet I really haven't formally published anything. <laughs> well, I shouldn't say that. I mean, you'll see a lot You're, of my writings in academic, yeah. in the academic journals. In your thesis, yeah. But, you know, you get to a point where it's like, well, I'm going to put it in a book and I, you get all wound up on it. But those are the three, def, those, those three. Now, if you notice those three things, they're all other centric as opposed to yeah. authenticity, which were all self, self-referential. Well, I, I know the first thing I noticed is there's nothing in here about, you know, being honest. That's correct. Right. That is correct. <laughs> like, does it matter? Um, I would argue that it, that it just, it should matter on a on a just a general ground. <laughs> but well, I I, I, yeah. I use I use the dementia story about my mm-hmm. mother as an example of something that potentially, you know, letter of the yeah. law, I, I, I am lying to her. Mm-hmm. True. Right? Because I'm saying something that is not true. I am giving your, you, you were even saying that earlier. You said something like, uh, I don't want to put words in your mouth. And you had said something about, you know, if, if you didn't, if you like withheld information. Right. That was being, right? Disingenuous. Yes. Well, okay. So even if I were not to have confirmed that her father was dead um, and withheld that information, right? Mm-hmm. Then, therefore, I'm being disingenuous. Yet, in the context of that, I think nobody would reprimand me for doing what I've done. Yeah. Because there's no sense in in my 90 year old mother who has severe dementia go through the agony every time that conversation because that conversation comes up no less than 10 times in one sitting, mm-hmm. right? Because she has dementia. So that's um, where the empathy I mean, kicks in. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. Mm-hmm. So that's where it's, thank you very much. That's where empathy kicks in, right? You take a look at the, the, the construct or the constraints of the conversation and you sit there and go, okay, there's, 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 there's no value in bringing this up. If anything, it's, it's detrimental. So you, 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 you take the situation into your own hands and say, okay, well, this is not something I'm going to share. Well, well, should, should empathy, it's just a question occurred to me because you know, if we're setting up a, a versus here, like a authenticity versus sincerity, yes. um, then I, it's not a line for a line thing, but does empathy always trump honesty then? I, I, or is it I, case by case? Yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, if, 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 if in the universe of constructs, 
i.e. authenticity and sincerity mm-hmm. live, then it's got to be dependent mm-hmm. upon. Now, if it's a universe of sincerity alone, and again, I want to make sure, you know, I mean, I am a sincere, sincerity expert, you know, evangelist, whatever term you want to use. <laughs> So, it, you know, but I, I, I think I like to think that I'm smart enough to say that, you know, that isn't my hammer of choice every time. <laughs> right. Um, so I would say in the universe of, of social constructs that all of this exists, I do believe it's a contextual issue that you that you can be um, pardoned, if you will, mm-hmm. by being um, less than truthful with, you know, i.e. Yeah. the white lie. Sure. Sure. I mean, there, there's a there's a. A spectrum of lies, right? I had a guest there on. Is, there is. I mean, yeah. the the thing that the, the the thing that is not a spectrum is whether that in reality is has has occurred or is true. Yes. And in in yeah. even in in society, um, which is an issue that I I currently have is, um, you know, people say things like, "Well, that's my truth." Mm. Well. Okay, so there's a the fact is that there is only one truth. I mean, I I don't know. I mean, people might see it differently, but I do think that there's an interpretation of that truth as it pertains to some con- contextual ramification of your circumstance that right. is either useful or not useful. And well, so that's when people say, "Well, that's my truth." Well, okay, so yeah. There, I, again, I, I understand they're maybe they're not the best words to use to describe mm-hmm. yeah. operationally what's going on, yeah. but um, but 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 the fact is I understand that people have that level yeah. of interpretation. That's, that's that's one of those words that drives me crazy, as I said that's earlier. Right. That where people are using the word for a different thing than what it actually means. Truth to me is objective reality. There's only one objective reality. Um, I mean. Without getting to metaverse and and quantum-y, well, you know. Well, it's, it's not, it's, I mean, it's know. not metaverse when you do bring in operational things, which is the thing that mm. I insist on doing every time I have these yeah. kinds of conversations. For example, mm. when someone says something's good, something is bad. I'll, I'll give you one. I, I was on a, another interview podcast where we talked about this idea of truth and, and, and people will say, well, that's, that's bad for the economy mm. or it's a, it's a, it's a bad economy, right? We're going through a recession right now. Yeah. So, right, so it's it's a bad economy. Economies aren't bad or good. <laughs> yeah. Right. They're just are, but they're 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 in a backdrop of set of constraints that says it's not good for me. I could tell you right now that there's somebody out there in the world, believe it or not, thinks that this economy is great because oh, they're reaping the benefit of the economy. There are loads of people in businesses that that know exactly how to operate. You know, in a no matter like when markets turn in a certain direction, um, and we talked about that earlier a little bit before, yeah, like I mean, off I mean, camera. But about, uh, yeah. uh, you know, here's a here's a classic one you can all take a look at uh, the 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 conference uh, the the video conference provider Zoom. Sure. Right. COVID hits. Work from home. Four five hundred percent growth over that period of time. Yeah. Um, you know, good for them, right? I mean, I'm not saying anything and they, they didn't exploit anything. They just basically landed there. I don't think they could have predicted what it would have happened. They were no. just a, a, a better way to do, uh, you know, conferences at home. And so, so my point is I have to assume that the CEO of Zoom basically said, boy, we, you know, we had explosive growth. It's great. We're a really great company a lot. Okay. Well, you know, okay. Some of that might be true, but the fact is that you now have a captive audience of people that need to figure out how to meet Mm-hmm. online in a in a flexible way and your product happens to deliver that. So you reap the benefit of the, the economic downturn based upon an external factor. Uh, right. To think that you were an economic genius and you were <laughs> you right. navigated the waters correctly might be a little bit of a stretch. <laughs> True. <laughs> so yeah. um so that happens all the time. Mm-hmm. So my point is there's always a level of standard that occurs that you have to do that, right? Um, C.S. Lewis says it best, right? You you cannot identify a crooked line without knowing what a straight one looks like. Indeed. I like that one. Yeah. Right? And so take that metaphor and apply it to whatever it is you're saying. When someone says bad, good, up, down, big, small, mm-hmm. you know. Well, you know, I mean, we're, always think- taught, we're always taught to look out for adjectives, um, uh, you know, especially 
when you're learning, when you're writing and when you're writing, it, you know, even college essays, going back to your high school essays, your college essays, those words, adjectives, adverbs, they alter perception. That's what they're there for, right? They, they're, they're creations. And, and, and they're, and they're useful and helpful. They're very to, useful. Right. You know, to, 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 to get, I mean, not, not saying they're bad, but, or, you know, to use adjectives, but, yep. but they do alter a, an expression of reality, you know, based on a person's interpretation. I mean, big is big. If, if you have a relative point of, of reference, so everybody can understand big compared to this pen, this TV screen is big, right? Everybody, that's the easy thing. Um, but bad, the economy's bad. Uh, you know, arguably a lot of people will say that. Yes, it's bad. Based on my reference from two months ago. Yeah, it's bad. It's bad. Well, it's um, it, because a preponderance yeah. of people have said so. That's right. But that, but that's where we draw the standard, the standardization sure. of the economy, as opposed to the economy itself, mm -hmm. which is an inanimate object or inadequate yeah. concept, if you will. Um, so, so this is all back down to you know we're talking about truths, right? We're talking about yes. trying to t trying to get to an expression of of reality, and we were talking about empathy, right? How sometimes it's okay to to have the white lie. It's it, it, and by the way, that reminded me of. Um, Sabrina Horn, um, one of my earlier guests who wrote a book called, um, make it, don't fake it. Um, and she, you know, she kind of uses oh, this. Wow. I got to read that It's terrific, book terrific I book. Sabrina's amazing. Read on that statement. Yeah. So make it, don't fake it. And she, she lays out this kind of continuum of lies and, you know, it, to, to vastly oversimplify and oversimplify. It's really like a lie is, is I suppose acceptable if it causes no harm to nobody else, right? And that's a very rare thing. So like the, 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 the untruth that you are letting your, 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 um, your grandmother, yeah. your mother kind of experience, yeah. that's, that is arguably uh, uh, causing good, right? So that's a different thing than saying, than saying, you know, hey, um, invest with me um, and I will give you 400% return and then pocketing the money and going someplace, you know, that's a very different yeah. kind of lie. So there's a spectrum, uh, an, uh, you know, a, um, a range of, of what's acceptable. So, you know, empathy has to kind of, you know, empathy works in when, it, when if empathy isn't an expression of honesty or if, or if you are not being honest and being empathic, um, you know, I suppose it is relevant. It is a little bit related to where, where that, un, where that dishonesty is on that, on that spectrum continuum of lies. Uh, yeah. this, this is really an interesting philosophical conversation actually. But, um, but what I really, where, where I wanted to go here was though, so, so you, you have, you're empathic, um, at, at work. Let's, let's, let's just use work as the, as the, um, as the environment we're talking about. So so you, you practice empathy at work. Um, your, your next point is purposeful altruism. You know, can, how does that then, do they play into one another or, or are these just different factors that happen at different times to define sincerity or, you know, and then, and then let's go back and sort of compare that to authenticity and, and, yeah, so let's, and see who, let's the, do who that. the grand Thank winner is. That, this yeah. is a good exercise because um, the reason I came up with the term purposeful altruism is because often – so altruism is, again, one of those words that is being discussed and bantered and probably will never land mm -hmm. in, a, in a good consensus in the academic world because there's a, there's a school of thought that says – Altruism is not truly altruism because we still get something out of it. For example, right. if I were to be nice to somebody, mm -hmm. I don't know, donate something, help somebody yeah. altruistically, right? Meaning I give with no, nothing in return. And then people said it's impossible to do that because you're getting the satisfaction of helping somebody. Always something. Right. So this, we're, we're constantly um, accused of this in the corporate world where there's no good deed, you know, uh, you know, we, we may uplift, um, 
you know, 5 million people this year out of abject poverty uh, and, and terrible sanit- sanitary conditions in my company, um, or not in my company, we, our company will uplift people out of, san- right. un- out of terrible sanitary conditions and save 500 kids a day from dying from diarrhea. All, nobody on planet earth would argue that those are bad things. However, for us to get credit for it is as, as an altruistic thing is not realistic. Yep. You know, we, we, there's something for us to gain. You know, and if, and and I mean, and, and there and is, I'm okay with it. I mean, yeah, there is. It's okay, right? Yeah, like even Bono from U2 said that, right? So Bono's, you know, he he's you know one of these guys that wears you know his emotions on his sleeves, right? and he was in an in an interview about this, and he basically and he takes every opportunity to push his his charities and his ideas, mm-hmm. but he's he's really interesting about it because he basically says, "Hey, look, if I'm a famous rock singer." that everyone likes to listen to and thinks that I'm like better than anyone else in the world. Great. <laughs> yeah. Because if I can use that to shed light on bad things that are going on in the world, I'm going to do it. Right. I don't know. To me, that seems that that was, you know, that's pretty cool. That seems pretty good to uh, me too. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm all, I'm all in for that, but since someone turns around and says, well, you know, I'm a very humble, as a matter of fact, let me tell you how humble I am. As, I would venture to say that I'm the most humble person on the planet. Right. I mean, you We've got heard those that from, people. I've heard that from, from, from people before. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, you know where I was going. So, yeah. um, so my point here is I call it purposeful altruism mm-hmm. because in my, in my research, it's an altruism that has purpose behind the other person. What am I going to do purposely for that other person? Whether or not I get anything out of it is irrelevant in the construct, that mm-hmm. social construct. And that's kind of how, okay. Um, that's what I would call in, in the academic world, cheating with words, right? Because yeah. I don't want to go down the path of saying, well, you're really doing it for that. Well, you know something, because I'm talking about someone else, mm-hmm. That's that's irrelevant in this conversation. And right. that's why I put that that adjective and that purposeful altruism in the beginning of it. Yeah. So the only reason that I can understand the altruistic part of it is because I I, I dealt with empathy. Mm-hmm. I, I want to share a story, if I may. Please. A quick story about about empathy. So in my in my research, I, I came across and so when I do research, I do not only hardcore academic research, original research, but I also do sort of what I call sort of popular culture type research, popular press type yeah. of research. I came across this interview with Alan Alda out of all people. Hmm. Alan Alda was talking about empathy and he basically says, you know, he was, he's a big em, 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 empath. Yeah. And he came to the conclusion, he goes, well, I'm going to get better at doing this. So how would I get better? Like, again, this is sort of speaks to my heart about operationally some of these philosophies. Because I think philosophies are great and you have to start somewhere, but they're useful. They're not useful if you don't put them into practice. And so he comes up with this idea that says, what I'm going to do is I walk down the street and I'm just going to like look at people. I'm going to notice people and I'm going to take a look and I'm going to paint a picture, a backstory about that particular person. Hmm. So he's walking down the street and sees a young lady and he looks at her in the eyes and she smiles and he smiles and he goes, oh, she's a college student and she's struggling to do this. And all of a sudden you put this backstory, which brings out your, your em, 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 empathetic, empathetic ap- appreciation for other people. Hmm. Oh, look at the, 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 the mom with the young boy, you know, she just picked him up and he got a good grade and they went out for ice cream. You know, all of these things are going to the back of his mind as he just kind of sits there and smiles and mm-hmm. says, hello, C- runs across a social scientist, not much different than myself and says, Hey, just came up this, you know, this idea all by yourself. He's like, yeah, I wanted to do that. He goes, why don't we put it to the test? So he put some rigor mm-hmm. behind this study. And here's the punchline to this one, which I love. Basically, the power of empathy is noticing. Okay. When you notice, you change your perspective, you change someone else's perspective, you dive into a new connection with somebody else when you notice. So, um, I found that to be eye-opening because it's so simple and yet 
so powerful. I mean, think about 2022 and our heads buried in our iPhones. Yeah. As we walk down the street and now you see memes of people like running into poles and stuff because they didn't lift their heads up. Oh, all the time. Noticing, right? All the time, right? So so empathy is going in the, the, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to ask though, like when you say the power of empathy is noticing, is that a fancy way of saying pay attention? Or is yeah, it more to it? Than well, that? I mean, I think it's pay attention in the sense of you, you, you also want to give it some, it's a meaning, right? Some mm. background. Like if you notice somebody, okay, well, what do you notice about them? Their eyes, their height, their, what they're saying, you know, there, there's plenty of studies out there that basically says, you know, the conversation and the words have very little meaning in, in a connection. Usually it's the nonverbal cues and mm-hmm. all this other stuff that goes, that really gives you a better, um, a better perspective on people. Mm. And that's where that noticing comes from. You know, as you take a look at people and you see how they act, what they say and all this, and, and then create that backstory to be able to start bringing your feelings into it. Because here's the interesting thing about empathy, go back to the operational view. What's yeah. empathy? Empathy basically is, I I have a perspective of your feeling of whatever the, your circumstance is, right? That's empathy as opposed to sympathy, where I I I uh, disassociate your your feelings. So that's the big switch between empathy mm-hmm. and 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 sympathy. Empathy is an association to those feelings. Sympathy is a disassociation of those feelings. Um, you go to YouTube and you type in Brene Brown. Mm-hmm. Empathy, and there's a cute little video of her narrating it, and somebody puts a, a kind of a cartoony video to it um, about these animals and stuff, and about the difference between sympathy and, and empathy. Right? Mm-hmm. Where empathy is, you know, somebody fell in the hole, and the other person like goes into the hole and sits next to you, as opposed to somebody else puts their head in the hole and go, "Gee, I'm sorry about you falling in the hole. Do you want a sandwich?" Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's a great <laughs> example. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so anyway, so that's, and then, and then just for completion sake, um, the third one, I don't know if, but you know, I want to be, uh, my show can go as long as we want, man. But, I, uh, no, I want to be respectful of your time. No, right? We're because, good. I mean, we're good. Can, Dem- you're, but you're, demonstrable, you know, I mean, demonstrable, demonstrable affirmation, right? So mm-hmm. demonstrable affirmation basically says, look, all of this stuff is all fine and well and good. But if you don't convince me that you really mean any of this stuff, it's irrelevant. Yeah. And so demonstrable affirmation is what are you actually going to do to affirm that belief such that other people can understand your view and your, your care and your point. And that could be as simple as just putting your hand on somebody's shoulder. Sure. Right. Maybe it's a a gift card when somebody is down. Um, You know, what do you, what is it that you're actually going to do to say, I'm empathetic for your situation. I'm going to I'm going to create a purposeful altruistic act and then I'm going to show you that I care about this situation that you're in. It's um, a it's a again to to sort of process a little bit get it in a in a very simple way of thinking for me this is the show don't this is the the walk the walk part of it isn't it? This is well, it, it is degree. because I mean, but yeah. it's one thing to go off and do this, and then that's fine. But how do how does someone know you're being sincere? Mm-hmm. And by the way, I want to be very clear about sincerity. I never in my study or in in my writings did I ever say that sincerity was you know rainbows and unicorns. Mm-hmm. So my point is that there might be a a, a an event in somebody's life that is not good that you have to put those into place. Notice that I've never qualified any of the terminology as being good or bad. This goes back to our earlier conversation about that. So empathy doesn't mean that I'm empathetic with your situation in some kind of judgmental way, one way or the other. I'm trying to embody the feelings that you're going through, right? Purposeful Mm -hmm. altruism is I'm going to do something that's good for you. Now that's something for good for you. I don't know. Let's just go through the extremes because it makes the point. I don't know. You're an intravenous drug user. Mm -hmm. For me to be purposeful altruistic is I need to get you in a rehab house. I need to, I need to do something to get you what I believe out of that situation. Um, you may not like that. (laughs) Yeah. 
right? I mean, there, right? So, so sincerity is not about, oh my goodness, I can't believe you did something. And demonstrable mm-hmm. acts, right? Demonstrable affirmation is I drive down to the, to the, you know, to the, to the, the crack house or whatever, and I yank yeah. your butt out of there, right? And I kick, kick, kicking and screaming and, and whatever it is that I need to do to show you. Well, is the, is the ultimate, really mean that. yeah, is the ultimate kind of result though, like to do, to do good, like to, to affect some sort of good. And, and, and I, I, I realize that good is an adjective and, you know, it's, it, it is subjective in some ways, but if, if you are, if you're practicing sincerity, I suppose, um, then, you know, you're, you're getting to a, a place that either you have defined or that's defined by the society around you, I suppose, as, as a, as a desirable result. But see, right? here's the thing is you could take it to the letter of law and say, as let's take, let's just use my drug user example. Mm-hmm. Somebody may say, well, if, if you're trying to be sincere and all this other stuff, you can quickly twist it and say, well, why aren't you delivering more drugs to the person? Because that's what they mm. want. Right. That's what they want. That's what they want. Right. So the question is, what is good for them? Mm. And good for them in this situation. Now, you know, I, I would hope by this day and age, we understand that there's never been a situation when someone says, well, if I only just did more drugs, my life would be better. Right. I mean, right. There's, right. there's right. No one's ever said that. Um, and, and there's probably a host of other things we can say that. So mm-hmm. that's, that's my point around that. Now there's some nuance to all that too. There might be some, some other types of things. And this is where that morality kicks in. Yeah. Which I don't necessarily, I'm, I'm not explicit mm-hmm. in stating, but I do suggest that sincerity when applied correctly is a betterment of someone else's life. According to the. Well, well yeah, according to social context. acceptable practices. Social right? acceptable, I mean, yeah. That's right. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's, it's, it's an, it's an ethical play. In, 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 in my paper, I write about my focus is around ethics and not necessarily morality. So let's, let's, circle back a little bit and now we have a pretty decent concept or idea of sincerity which i think you just summed up really nicely which what is good for them and when we think back to authenticity it's what's good for me um it's it's what's good for me which i think will be will deliver what's good for everybody else so you know ultimately you want to get to the same point where you're 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 either doing good or or affecting good whatever good means, but you're, 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 you're making that happen. But the path to get there is, seems to be vastly different because it, it seems more direct almost in the sincerity model where you're, you're just not focused on that self-referential point almost at all. And you're focused in on the other, which is what you said earlier, but I, I, I don't know if I'm getting there right. I don't know if I'm, make, if I'm tying that knot properly. Let me, let me give you a, a sort of a, a, common social view of things everybody and and this is where everybody kind of rings a bell when i start talking about this so everybody heard about the golden rule Mm -hmm. right the golden rule basically states do unto others as they would have them to do you now in a very academic philosophical perspective that suggests that your values and morality are key yeah I'm going to judge how I treat you as how I want to be treated. Mm-hmm. That may not necessarily be the truth, right? Maybe mm-hmm. maybe you want to be treated differently. As a matter of fact, I'm betting that you would want to be treated differently than me. Now, again, I'm not going to go with the big, you know, yeah. like I'm not, you know, yeah, don't yeah. hurt me. They'll cause, you know, I'm not going down that path. Right. But the platinum rule, if you ever heard of the platinum rule, says treat others as they would want to be treated. It's one that's sort of less known, but it's sort of coined. And I don't know exactly who coined it, but it's one that I'll, I'll surface here in this conversation where someone says, well, that sounds really good, Tom. That sounds real pithy. Mm-hmm. It's like a nice little saying that should be on a book somewhere. But how hard is that? Like if, if the golden rule is easy because you know who you are, you live with yourself all the time. But if I'm applying the platinum rule, a suggests other people and B, everybody's so different. 
So my sincere act on one person may not translate to a sincere act to another person because the, the value set that we're working off of is theirs, not mine. It also Which requires to get to know somebody. That's, what, that's exactly what I was about to say. It requires like a little bit of, for, of, of knowledge of forefront, right? Like yep. authenticity sounds lazy then when you put it that way. It's like, I, I, I and I, I'm sorry, I, I keep beating on authenticity a lot. Um, for a lot of reasons, I mean, things way overused and we're forced into a box there, but takes work to be sincere. Uh, and, you know, if it takes work to be authentic, then it's not authentic, is it? That's correct. There's so many but paradoxes I mean, here. No, I mean, it is. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm not suggesting necessarily because I'm, I'm hoping that mm -hmm. if you take a look at it, and again, I laid out the timeline. So 94, yeah. transformational leadership comes out. We find out that maybe there's more to it than that. Authenticity shows up in 2005. Sincerity shows up in 2014. That's my my mm -hmm. writing. Heck, maybe 2030, we've got some other guy that's going to write on, say, how Tonkin had it all wrong, and here's what this, there's a better thing. And it's an evolutionary mm -hmm. perspective because it's based on what's happening in society and what it is that we need. Because mm -hmm. I personally believe that the misuse of authenticity, and again, I use the term misuse of authenticity right. because authenticity onto itself is, is, is a concept. But the misuse of that concept, I think, has gotten us into some trouble. There's a famous comedian that I'll, that in one time mentioned talking about doing drugs. And some he had asked somebody, well, you know, what does doing drugs do for you? And he says, well, it enhances, it enhances my personality. And he says, well, what if you're an a-hole? <laughs> Stephen Wright. I believe that was Stephen Wright. No, it wasn't. No? Damn. I'll, I'll, keep, I'll keep my name to myself. Oh, man. I thought that was the one from Grace. Oh, um, all right. Well, you know. Yeah. It, that's <laughs> I all. don't want to lose. I don't want to lose the. the that's the, okay. Yeah, my, the, that's fine. The goodness I'm not, tainted by who said it. But, no, I'm not uh, worried about. I'm no, not worried. Stephen Wright's a good guy, too. Yeah, yeah. He's, 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 one, he's one of my favorite, right? 92% of all statistics are made right on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> he's no, that it, all the time. He's, he's you know, he's, he's, he's great. But uh, look, there's. The point is well taken though, right? So um, the misuse of authenticity um, being the problem, sincerity being the way to address that problem or just a different way to approach things. Now, if you're in a corporation, if you're, in, you're, if you're, if you are, you know, I guess creating or building an engaged employee workforce, you know, trying to you know, build an environment where folks feel comfortable, rewarded, um, able to do their work. We're under this impression right now uh, that in order to, for that to happen, you have to be, you have to be authentic and you have to give everybody the room to be their authentic self. Now, if, if I'm giving people the room to be authentic, then that's, since that's sort of a, a step towards sincerity, isn't it? Right. So, so that's, Correct. that's a good thing. Um, I when, just don't think it's possible. And, in, in I think that's why it's, there's always, you, you'll always hear this, this one phrase and maybe, you know, exactly what I'm sure you know what exactly it is, but you'll always hear this one phrase. We still have a lot of work to do. That's the phrase you always hear. So it's never going yeah, to be. I mean, I'll take it to the extent that I just think we're barking up the wrong tree. I don't care yeah. how much work we put into it. Well, so I just I'll, don't I'll think just, I'll go that far. And, and I wish that that might, that would be the conclusion of organizational developers everywhere, you know, however, um, and I don't know if I'm going to get in trouble for this, but the point is that, um, if, you know, if, the, if there's, if there's always a little bit, if there's always more work to do, it means we're never going to finish. We're never going to achieve whatever the, whatever the goal is, which sort of makes you believe that, you know, there is no real goal. I think, I think the principal tenants are incorrect and that's, mm -hmm. and that's the reason I think it's going to fail. And, you know, there's more work to do. Sounds like a cop out to me mm -hmm. because I, I, you know, the, a, a bad idea is a bad idea. Yeah. Regardless of how it gets applied and you want to apply, you want to apply a bad idea really well. It's still a bad idea. You know, it was funny. Uh, mm -hmm. Marcus Buckingham talks about oh, yeah. this all the time. He talks about because he he's a he's a researcher at heart. Strengths finders, right? He started that. Did he? Was he? Was the originator? No, no, that's, uh, no, no, that's uh, Cliff. Well, that's Clifton. Th but then it's uh, Travis. 
Travis's his name. I thought he was. Very, I thought he was part of that, um, and then he split off to do his own thing. Maybe, well, maybe I'm, I'm. You know, he's got the he he had the Buckingham Group, which I think he sold to ADP. Um, mm-hmm. But he did a lot of performance management. That was kind of a yeah. shtick. Um, but he basically talks about um, th- this idea that uh, um, what's it going with with performance management that. I'll give you an example. He he does this. He he and it was this was not his original study. There's a study actually in the academic world where he draws from. It basically says all performance management tools. You know, is a meta study that talked about sixty three percent of the tool really focuses on the in, uh, on the rater, not the ratee. Mm. So the the performance management. If I if I was giving you a performance management I don't know, assessment you know, yeah. of your performance at co- in the company. Basically, it would be 63% of the findings would be more about me than it mm-hmm. is about you. Yep. Which, you know, the irony is is so thick there. <laughs> um, but the, the, the view of, of the, the organizational, the, 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 the paradigms that we live in, as it pertains to operationalizing within an organization as to some of these terms like, you know, bring your authentic self, you know, mm-hmm. to work R- really doesn't work. And I'll tell you why, because you, you, you have to live in a, in an organism, right? There's no such thing as like when, when I write um, for, for companies, like there was a while there that I was writing white papers and stuff for companies. They would, or, or, or I would edit them or we'd have this conversation. People would say things like, well, leadership thinks mm. or the organization thinks. I'm like, well, no, n- neither one of those can think because they're not things. Right? They're, they're abstract. W- we all know what that means, but it is a fancy way of deflecting whatever bad idea you're talking about. Mm. You're saying – the CEO and his direct staff said, <laughs> "Yeah, that's what you're saying." Yeah, they can. They discuss. Now, the minute concluded. you say that, it's like, Ooh, "Ouch!" That gets a little too close, you know. It does. Or the organization Cringy. feels. I think no, no, no. Mm-hmm. The staff that works at this company feels. <laughs> and so, the minute you start personalizing a lot of that stuff, then you get to the next level of saying, "Well, how do I then operationalize and?" Mm-hmm. Policify. Pol- I'm going to make a word up. Creating a policy from <laughs> policy. <Policify. laughs> I like it. I just made that up. Mm-hmm. Um, it's something that's based upon, say, authentic- authenticity. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, it's it's it, it's counterintuitive. Yeah. Because well, it's you know you know how can I be my authentic self? Where potentially we would rub against, you know the the policies and procedures of a company that have to conduct themselves within the constraints of, of the economy and mm-hmm. of regulation. Yeah, and and that that goes back to even what I said at the very beginning. I mean, you know that's why I think when we talk about, you know, being your authentic self, it's it's sort of held up out there as a almost like um, that definition of art. I forget who said it. It's like. Um, you know, I, 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 I don't know if I, I don't know if it's good, but I, but I know it when I see it, or I don't know if it's art, but I know it when I see it. Something well, it like was that. actually that little statement came from the, the judgment on Larry Flint. Oh, the pornography thing. The, hus- the pornography. Oh yeah. Yeah. That was, uh, that's where they came from. I don't know right? if it's, it's porn, but I know it when I see it. That's right. Yeah, correct. That's right. Okay. Right. And that yeah. was the big argument of mm-hmm. the, of the defense, Larry Flint saying, you know, Hey, you define what pornography is and I will stop doing whatever that is. <laughs> right. And, and that's, so what I think that's the way sort of authenticity is like, well, I know it when I see it. Um, and it's all, you know, it's very feelings based and it's very like, you know, I, I don't want to p- give other people my lens and that's part of the issue with authenticity, but like if, if I feel that somebody's authentic, right. And as, as a leader in an organization, it's sort of, you know, one of the things I'm kind of supposed to be looking out for is like, if uh, this person is, is being authentic and which, which I think is a, just a fancy way of saying, oh, I can trust this person. And I'd rather say this person's trustworthy or this person has demonstrated um, that they, the integrity, 
Uh, and I don't know what they're bringing to work every day, but I like it. Right. I mean, they show up, <laughs> they got great things to say. They get along with people, you know, when they're upset, they let me know. In other words, they're being a person, they're being a person and, 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 you know, I guess being, being transparent to, to a point, you know, I don't need to know every motivation that's in their soul. And I certainly don't need to know, you know, their entire moral universe. Um, but I but do this need is the, to, this but, is the conversation that you have between empathy and compassion, by the way. Okay. Yeah. Because compassion is, is the, is, 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 is the kissing cousin of empathy. Mm -hmm. Paul Bloom talks a lot about this. Yeah. And it's again, part of my research where I use the term em empathy on purpose. I don't use compassion. Mm -hmm. However, let's be very clear. There are times that I don't want people to be empathetic with me. Mm -hmm. For example, and again, I'm very vocal about this. I, I have a therapist. I've had a therapist for a long time. It's good, right? If people have personal trainers, they should have therapists. It's the same kind of thing, right? Mm -hmm. Sort of a trainer for your brain and your heart. Um, I don't want my therapist to be empathetic. <laughs> right. You want I your want them to be compassionate. Compassionate. Mm -hmm. Right? Because I need a third party view. If his, if his job is to help me with my mental struggles. The last thing I need is for, the, for that person to be sitting on the park bench with me. Feeling my mental struggles, <laughs> right? Feeling my, right? I need them to come back and say, I, I want them to be more sympathetic to say, I get it. And here are some interventions. It sounds like companies need interventions some, in some ways. Uh, and gosh, there's so much further. I would love to go in and I want to reserve the right to bring you back. Um, and there's so much we didn't get to, but I, I really have a lot of thinking to do after this conversation, but I, I, I want to kind of wrap up if, if you don't mind, if you can just cut, sort of offer up like in a nutshell, what do leaders or organizations or both need to do now, you think, or what should they do now to shift from that authenticity approach to that sincerity approach? I mean, are there specific things that they should do or is it just a matter of reframing the conversation? No, I, I, no, I, th I, think, there's a, again, <laughs> I think there's a lot of work to do. Yeah. Um, but I think that work does start with outlining your, your set of values and beliefs. Mm -hmm. There's an aspect here right now that we seem to want to make people happy. Um, this is going to sound really, really weird, um, but I'm going to say this. And I'm mm -hmm. going to say this on my behalf, and I don't put words in anyone's sure. mouth. Sure. I do not believe that the meaning of life or the achievement of life is happiness. Um, I don't think that's a goal that I certainly don't strive for happiness. It sounds kind of sadomasochist to be able to, to say that, but I, and I'll tell you why I say that. Because feelings and happiness and everything in that realm changes. Mm -hmm. And so when you apply policy to a fundamental of a foundation that is very malleable, that's a recipe for disaster. You'll never be able to enforce that. And so my point is there's got to be a cognitive truth in which policies are created. And unfortunately, in our society right now, we are very keyed into creating policies that make you feel like, I'll give you an example. I talk a lot about diversity, equity, inclusion. Mm -hmm. I don't know about anyone, but there's a moral component that says we should all be treated equal and all that. And I'm, I'm not saying anything like, but let's, let's be honest here around how companies are come together, right? It's, uh, it's about creating value and money and, and growing. Mm -hmm. Mike, I did research study, 16 <laughs> companies that had boards that, that had men and women on the board were 16.1% more profitable mm -hmm. than companies that only had men and only had women. So one of the things I said is you can have this whole conversation of how about it's, you know, everybody's equal and everyone should be treated. I'm not suggesting yeah. that at all. But sure. what I am also suggesting is there's an immutable truth that says Guess what? Diversity of thinking is good for business. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
And creating policies on that mm -hmm. is nothing more than, than doing the right thing for your employees and your yeah. their shareholders and stocks. So if you're asking me that question, build policies that are based on immutable facts. That there is maybe the solid ground that we're looking for here, right? Is that, I like what you said, the cognitive truth rather than objective truth or objective reality. I mean, there's a, there's, there's a lot to, to, that we have to, I think, continue to tease out um, in, in, in corporate America, corporate, wherever we are. But fundamentally, if we can base our decisions and base our, you know, policies, I suppose, on not on what makes people happy, but on what is, you know, those, those immutable truths, like you said, diversity, um, diversity of thought is absolutely better for the company. It's, it's, a, it's a truth that's been measured and there are statistics to prove this, et cetera, et cetera. Um, rather than just, you know, having more women on the board makes me happy or, or gives me some sense of, of goodwill. I, I hope it does. I hope it does give you a sense of goodwill, but that's not the reason why you should make the policy. The reason why you well, should- Well, and, and again, there's yeah. other things that may make you happy as yeah. well, right? That's because we change, right? I go back to this idea of feelings, right? They change over time. And, uh, you know, it's again, it's hard to disagree that all people should be treated equal and you should treat them equal. And then there should never be a reason for you not to treat them equal. Yeah. Now, what does that mean from a policy perspective? Right. There's a, mm -hmm. I, I talk about diversity, equity, inclusion, where people get so wound up on hiring a minority, say a woman yeah. or a black person or whatever, because they want to fulfill that. And the problem is they're doing a disservice to that person because that person may not be qualified for nothing more than they're just not qualified. Yeah. That's all. Yeah. And so now you put them in a weird situation and you've actually done yourself harm in that mm -hmm. situation. If you want to play that person, yeah. well, great, get them training, get them experience, get them whatever you need them to do so they can be qualified. Yeah. Right. And, and I, and I've seen this constantly mm. over and over and over and over. So that's my point about the feeling good part. Yeah. It's like, let's, can we land on some place where we can agree that this is, this is an, a, uh, a cognitive truth, mm -hmm. meaning we all believe and have the facts and the data to, to back it up and then act accordingly and not place our, our, uh, our operations on, on quicksand, i.e. feelings. Yeah. And feelings are the basis of essentially the basis of authenticity. Whereas uh, cognitive truth seems to be the basis of, sincerity and Mike, I, yeah, that's the plan. That's the plan. <laughs> that's the plan. You know, I mean, look, we're, we're, we're sort of in my, in my experience, this is breaking a little bit new ground here. I mean, you know, you, you are, we said at the beginning, these are some controversial ideas, you know, rather than thinking of the controversial, I just, I just think that there's a little disruption and certainly just, we have to question. I think I, you know, the idea of questioning constantly where we're at is a very healthy thing. Um, and to question things that make you uncomfortable is, is a natural thing to do. And, and I've always felt a little bit uncomfortable in some ways with the concept of authenticity, because I draw it out to that conclusion, like, wait a second, <laughs> my truth, your truth, what's going on here. But you know, what it means to me doesn't, isn't necessarily what it means to everybody else. And that's also a problem, but, but look, you know, companies are evolving and, and I really do hope that, that we get to, uh, a, a point where the idea of sincerity, as you've kind of laid it out here, Tom, is more readily available. And I hope I do my part in helping that to happen. Um, and um, be on the lookout for the book uh, when it when it's when it's out. Um, do you have a timeline on that yet? Or are you still working? Well, I'm, it's, I mean, it's, it, I'm, I'm, you know, any, anytime you write a book, it's a negotiation with with agents and publishers, they like they don't want a book, right? They They want the ability for you to write a book that makes money. Right. And so I'm in there, but I mean, the, 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 the book is quote unquote written. Okay. 
Um, but we're, you know, editing and trying to figure out right. publication dates and, you know, marketing all this other stuff. Uh, hopefully first half of the year. I so imminent is probably the answer. By yes. the time, by the time this air, this airs, it should be, it'll be around that time that during the first half yeah. of the year. Well, so, none of this, what have we talked about? <laughs> yeah. will change. Yeah, so. None of this change. These are, these are, <laughs> right. these are cognitive truths that we're talking about. That's sort of immutable. Yes, and that is just, I love that about the show. And look, we've gone long, but it's been a really incredible lesson, I think, um, and discussion for me anyway, I've learned quite a bit and hopefully I've, I've, I've been able to state some semblance or, or kind of put some sense in my own words to, to, to what you are trying to, um, to convey Tom, um, cause you do it far, far better than I ever could. And, um, I just really want to thank you for presenting your point of view, but also helping me understand my own thinking about authenticity more. Um, it's certainly going to be helpful to me. And I know it'll be helpful to many of, of my listeners. And if any of my listeners out there, you know, aren't really sure about it, just ask questions, you know, you know where to find me. Um, and you can find Tom on LinkedIn, uh, Dr. Tom Tonkin. That's uh, T-O-N-K. And his, his name will be spelled properly in the episode title. Um, you can find him on Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, everywhere with, with a, uh, a, under the handle D-R Tom Tonkin, uh, T-O-N-K-I-N. Um, and um, he will be very happy to to answer your call should you desire to to speak with him. Tom, is there any other? Oh, oh one other place it would be uh, salesconservatory.com. Um, Tom's yep. company, um, salesconservatory.com. Conser- It'll be in the, in the show notes. Anything else I missed, Tom? That um, where, where people can well, find no, you? I mean, uh, well, first of all, thank you for sharing the platform um, to yeah. be able to, to get this, you know, th- this out, um, you know, because that's how it gets discussed uh, is out there. And, I'm, you know, uh, those that disagree with me get uh, get to get to the front of the line <laughs> um, because, you know, I, I still want to sort of whittle this away. Uh, to to somebody that becomes useful. That's is very much what my situation is. But no, I I think again you could see all the different dimensions of the conversation and then how we can continue to grow. And you get more more questions as you as you think about it. I just hope that we don't lose the ability for honest debate and discourse in society. Well, if we're sincere, we wouldn't. <laughs> Right. I, well, I, think, I hope that's the I think case. That's the case. Sometimes it's a challenge. Yeah. Well, it's a, it is a, you, look, it's a, it's a honest living, I think, here we're trying to have um, and, um, you know, bring these ideas out into the world, um, push them uh, well thought out and well kind of argued um, into the mainstream consciousness if we can. And, um, I, you know, I can't wait to see the book so that we can do just that. Um, Tom, I, I, you know, what an incredible pleasure and honor to have you on the show. Thank you so much. Um, and um, yeah, we will um, we'll want you have on, ha- want to have you on again sometime. Excellent, Dan. Thanks again. Thanks, everybody. All right. Thanks for listening to the Dan Nessel Show. I hope you really enjoyed this episode. You know, people always ask me, why do I do the show? I do it for the ratings. I do it for your validation. So do me a favor. Go over to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or someplace else, wherever you're listening to podcasts and subscribe, leave a review, rate me and share with your friends. Anything you can do to spread the word, I deeply appreciate it. Thanks again for listening to The Dan Nessel Show.